Hi everyone. Welcome to See the Invisible, Living with an Invisible or Rare Disease. My name is Rhonda Franny Jefferson, and thank you so much for taking some time out to listen today. If you're new to this page, I want to welcome you and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share some of my experiences, um, talk about ways that we can cope in our everyday challenges, and you know, I just really appreciate the the opportunity to share some of that with you. I know going through this last year and we're really getting ready to approach that full year now, it's been tough on everybody and having a type of illness or a disability, that just adds another level to the everyday challenges that we already have to face. I also wanna celebrate our successes because all of us are survivors and we're victorious once we get through every day. Um, I know that we have to adapt to just the changing health scene that we have right now, that day to day things are changing. I do also wanna show support for those who are our support system, our loved ones, family, friends, and even the medical personnel that helps. Um, they're also you know, going through a time period right now where on top of the cases that they would see in their hospitals, they're getting you know, inundated or flooded with patients. And this past year, they have been our true heroes. The first responders, they go out there selflessly and put their lives on the line each time that they come in contact with someone who may possibly you know, have COVID. Um, I did actually know a healthcare professional who passed away not too long ago and she truly was a wonderful woman, and she's a hero. All of the medical personnel helping us are heroes. So, you know, I really want to focus on things that are positive. I know during all of this, um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, I had some experiences on social media where people were less than nice about what they thought about people with underlying conditions, and it really kind of lit a spark in me um, to say, you know what, if someone's saying that to me, I know that people are saying it to other people. So I wanted to find a way just to let people know that they're not alone. I also did just want to mention that, you know, I know on top of everything we're going through with COVID, um, there has been severe weather in the South um, over the past couple weeks I mean something that they really haven't seen before and then the electric grid so I am thinking of you guys every day um, that you know went through that or is still going through the aftermath of the weather so just everyone's in my thoughts and my prayers and I hope everybody is doing well so before I do start I always like to say that I am NOT a medical insurance or legal expert I do hope to share my experiences and provide information that I find from public sites on the internet. Um, in many cases, I will use my own personal experiences to provide feedback on that information. And today, um, I'm kind of leaning towards this being a two-part episode. You know, I haven't gone through all of the um, you know, points that I want to go through verbally yet, so I'm not quite sure of exactly how long it will take, but if it starts to take over a half an hour, which I'm pretty sure it will, then um, I'll spread this out to a two, possibly three-parter. So what I'm actually looking at is how we approached, and when I say we, I mean us as a nation in the United States, and then also you know, the world, because we all learn from each other, I think, about you know best ways to handle it, not to handle it, and you know, we did actually work together with a lot of countries and it did in a lot of ways unify us. So I want to take a look back at the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, which I will actually go through the name and the misnomer that it has, um, not actually being the Spanish flu. Um, but I want to look at how things changed, um, not only with the direct approach on how the pandemic was, um, you know, was looked at, but also just other factors in the background, even things that people might not think of, that actually 
led to either more spread of um, the Spanish flu compared to coronavirus or COVID, um, you know, condition, living conditions that they might have had, things like that, um, that really underscore, you know, the differences and the similarities between 1918 and today. So um, I know also I found today, such as in, two th I'm sorry, 1918, there were, you know, socioeconomic issues and the socioeconomic status that did play into how people were treated. Um, this pandemic, they were a little more than a century apart. And in some ways we can look back at a century. And if you look at pictures from 1918, things were so, so different. Um, now I don't wanna quote, or don't quote me on these numbers, but I did take um, kind of a, a seminar a few years ago and someone had looked at all the technological advances that we had made and I think it was something like all of this all of the technical advances that were made in 2004 were at that point being made every 30 minutes so if you looked at the amount or the number of advances that were made in the early 2000s and compared it to you know a day even now, there were more, many more technological advances taking place each day now. So we're really changing at you know, a really quick pace. So when you look at the pictures from 1918, and I'm gonna be going over some parts of World War I as well, the, the planes they had then, compare it to the fact that we've been on the moon, that there's a space shuttle, there is a space station, and people are even looking at commercial flight to space. So um, yeah, this is probably the introduction episode is gonna be a little bit of a history um, of things, but just imagine 1918, a lot of people didn't have their own phones. Um, you know, not every street was, um, was paved and you know, pictures were black and white. There was no sound in video, just, dozens and dozens and dozens of changes per day, advancements per day that are happening now. And if somebody could speak with someone then and think about, you know, how many, or how did they imagine 2021 might be, they probably couldn't imagine what it would be like now. Um, I did come across some information that there was um, a man who lost his twin brother to the Spanish flu. Now he doesn't remember his twin brother because they were infants. Um, that gentleman passed away from COVID. He was 102 years old. So the Spanish flu lasted until um, part of 2020. So his twin brother caught it and passed away and he then passed away at 102 um, due to COVID. There was also a woman who lost a sister before she was born um, from Spanish flu, and then she you know, she did pass away as well um, from coronavirus. But then there was one gentleman who survived both Spanish flu um, and COVID-19. So when you look at it that way, the fact that at least three people that I came across, um, sorry, came across just with a couple searches that shows while well, looking at pictures and thinking about how things were seems so long ago but they're actually really really close because we have people who've lived through all of these advances and saw things that they probably couldn't even imagine um so i i find that amazing too i think i would be in awe if you know the changes were coming that rapidly and you're thinking about growing up and you know having a limited number of toys or books and now it's just like books are on our computers so I'm probably going off a little bit on a tangent there but it seems like in a blink of an eye about a year ago the things that we took for granted were no longer available to us um, you know we we wanted you know, we're a very materialistic society so 
you know, sometimes if something material is taken away, we kind of feel that. Um, thinking back to my kids, if they haven't done their homework, I'll take away their tablet. And, you know, that's something that we feel that's tangible, that's physically felt. But then I think we started to really understand the intangibles, the things that we can't touch, those memories that we'll lose because we didn't get to spend a holiday with some of our loved ones. We didn't get to walk in you know, to a family member's house at Thanksgiving and give them a hug. We didn't feel that this year. And I think we've come to an appreciation of all those things that we took for granted. Um, but we also had some positives that came out of that. We found ways that we could get around that with things like Zoom. Um, so, you know, kind of as things were changing, and again, they changed very quickly this year as, you know, um, things were going to homeschool, things like that. I heard the term Spanish flu kind of batted around. Um, I didn't know much about it. And you know, I just knew it kind of happened, you know, near the end of World War One, and that really was about it. Um, I knew it affected the whole world; that it wasn't just, you know, isolated to one area. Um, and the number that I had always heard affiliated with the number of people who died was around 50 million. Now, there is definitely not a number that people agree on now. Um, some people are saying now that it's closer to uh, to 17 million, that there was um, a reassessment done by the American Journal of Epidemiology, and that was done in 2018, and they think the numbers are closer to 17 million, which is still a huge number. Whether it's compared to 17 million or 50 or 100 million, that's still a huge impact on the world. You know, just what might have been with all of those people, the contributions they may have been able to make, and the impact of the loss to their families. Um, one of the differences, though, is this really attacked the younger people. Um, you know, the elderly were actually more safe, um, had a better chance of survival than those that were young. Um, and men actually had the highest rate of contracting Spanish flu. And it's thought to be that's because they were the ones who went out to work and came in more contact with people. So that makes sense in that time period. That's what was happening. However, in other countries where women may have been the ones who might go from house to house to family members and try to help them, the women were the ones who actually had a higher percentage. Um, I will say finding some information about you know, um, socioeconomic issues, um, anything to do with gender, it was very, very hard um, to find anything about that regarding the Spanish flu. And even how disabilities and chronic illnesses may have been treated then, it was a world apart. Um, but that does make me want to say too, um, and what I found was a lot of articles were putting disability and chronic illness all into one category. And while there you know, are many, many cases where a chronic illness can lead to a disability, it's not always you know, together. You may have somebody who has a certain disability or impairment, but otherwise they're 100% healthy, um, such as someone who is hearing impaired which early on, um, you know, as a society, we found that we needed something to help communicate for those who were hearing impaired. So the masks were made where the, um, the mouth, I'm sorry, the mouths were visible. So, you know, we recognize those needs, but to find anything like that about the Spanish flu, um, I really struggled to find anything. So what I'm really going to need to do is just kind of or I've read some of the articles and came up with what sounds like was going on. In other words, whether or not someone had access to you know, facilities or a way um, that they could find someone to help them. So, you know, again, though, I did find a lot of articles that you know, were, were kind of looking at it as a one size fits all category. 
um, of being disabled and having a chronic illness. And again, those are two separate things and many times they do overlap. But looking at it as a whole, saying that, okay, this is what we need to do. It doesn't, as a society, I'm glad that there's recognition that there may need to be things that are adapted to help those with disabilities or chronic illness, but at the same time, to not recognize the individuality of each person and each illness or each disability or impairment, that is really doing a disservice as well, because what would work with me as someone with a mobility issue would not work the same as someone with a hearing impairment and needs to speak with someone but the bank branch or um, the doctor's office or wherever they happen to be going isn't open and they need ways to communicate. So I mean, again, that's a vast difference as far as what, um, what treatments should be, what accessibility should be, um, because we have totally different needs. So again, I'm very appreciative that there's a recognition that those who have a disability, um, have an impairment, or um, you know have a chronic illness, may need certain. Um, I'm sorry, I can't think of the word right now. Accommodations. That's it. Um, they may need certain accommodations. It's not going to be the same for every person, and I think sometimes that's what people struggle with. Um, so. That was something I came across too that I wanted to get out of the way earlier um, rather than later because it may impact some of the you know other um, aspects of the history. So going back to the Spanish flu, um, it was called the Spanish flu, but it actually you know there's no way to really know whether it actually originated in Spain. The actual first, known case was in the United States, but this was 1918, World War One was still going on, and literally thousands of men were being sent overseas, cramped in, you know, ships, you know, to go overseas and very cramped conditions, and if one or two people had it, it would spread, and then as soon as those men hit the shores, it would spread again to others. So, you know, instead of going into containment, those who were in control didn't, they didn't do anything to stop it. Um, so I really think what would have happened if it hadn't been World War I, if it had still been that time period, but there were no ships sailing, you know, just for say pleasure cruises like we had um, at the beginning of COVID and the lockdowns, you know, they w weren't going to be taking a ship over to Europe by the thousands for you know just to go over there so there would have been a large number of people who did not go to Europe and that would have really limited the spread so we can't go back really and change things but I know that would have made such a huge difference if there wasn't you know the um, the travel due to the war from going from country to country to country because as soon as um, the soldiers would get to Europe, they might be stationed in different areas. So then it's spreading again to each individual area um, that they were being sent to. Um, and one of the reasons, or probably the primary reason why the name was the Spanish flu is because they were not involved in the war. Um, the U.S., um, other countries in the Allies really wanted to keep morale up and so they didn't really report on what was going on with the influenza. Whereas Spain, you know, they weren't part of the war. They didn't have morale to keep up for, you know, thousands and thousands of soldiers. Plus um, their king also did get very ill too. So that probably played a factor as well, that it was a hope, uh, sorry, a high profile case. So um, that's why it was named the Spanish flu. Um, but again, the first um, suspected case was actually in the United States. So that was kind of interesting um, because if you looked at different countries, they would actually call it different things, um, you know, such as the Brazil flu or the German flu. It was just, depending on where you lived, someone might have had a different name to it. 
Now, being in the war as well, it also led to other aspects of how and why the Spanish flu, or I'm just going to call it influenza from now on, how the influenza spread. And that was during wartime, not just the soldiers, but people who live near and around areas that are being um, basically demolished or bombed, they're losing everything. They don't have access to the hygiene, to the food, water, just basic needs that they, they need. And sometimes then they're more susceptible to becoming ill or catching something. So that was you know, something too that kind of led to a very quick spread um, of the influenza. Then when the war was over, unfortunately the governments did not remain transparent or become transparent on things and soldiers were going home to you know, their towns, their hometowns, and spending time with their family and friends. And if they had been exposed, then unfortunately that was spreading it as well within the United States. So once all was said and done, they, um, the historians do believe about 500 million, I'm sorry, um, yeah, had to reread that, 500 million people were actually suspected to have had um, the influenza. So if we look at the numbers today, they're devastating for what's happening with COVID-19. But looking back to 1918, the numbers are just truly staggering there. So um, some of the, the things that really affected whether or not someone passed away was, again, some socioeconomic classes. Um, if you lived in a population or area where there was a lot of pollution, then you were more susceptible to catching this um, influenza and actually passing away. Um, they, of course, again, can't go back and look at things um, in real time, but researchers have looked at numbers and have thought that there's a direct correlation between the air pollution and the influenza. Um, now, I know I've been going through a lot of things and I actually went through a number of articles. I will link information to um, the articles in the description of the podcast because, again, there were quite a few. Um, so, you know, the, the public health um, officers and you know, the towns and across the nation, they wanted to focus on containment. But, you know, it, it was impossible to catch because people were already coming over, I'm sorry, already coming home from Europe where it had been spreading. And again, they're going home to their own um, hometown. So what the governments did to try to keep morale up ended up hurting you know, both the United States and the world just because of the disease being transmitted in the way it was in that there was a lot of travel due to the war. Um, and again, they were trying to keep morale up. World War I, it is estimated about 9 million people died. So if we look at the low end of the estimate, approximately 17 million people dying from the Spanish flu, that was, you know, at 17 million, that's a, just a little bit less than double the amount that died in the war. So in a way, you know, to try to keep the morale up of the men who were serving overseas, it ended up kind of coming back and biting us in that so many more people died as a result of the influenza. Um, now, there were a lot of things that were done in 1918 that um, there were a lot of things done in 1918 that were very similar to what happened at the um, beginning of the pandemic in 2020. Um, a lot of cities did try to you know, put in an effort to reduce the number of cases. Unfortunately, just like today, there weren't any consistent 
you know, policies. It varied by state to state, by city to city. So it was very hard to really contain the infection if there wasn't going to be a consistency. Um, but they did find the cities which you know, did have containment plans and ones that were pretty much followed, they did have lower infection rates. So, um, you know, I, I do look back last year and I, I don't know if possibly we had done a little more to, you know, for two weeks, you know, self-isolate, quarantine, find a way to do that if everybody had been able to do that, if the numbers would have been able to drop. Um, you know, can't really go back in time and find that out. But while reading this and it said, you know, cities that were able to follow a containment plan really did reduce um, the number of cases. So, um, you know, back in 1918, they, they had a good plan and it seems like some cities were really able to, um, you know, to control the actual spread of the disease. Um, so, I think this is where I'm going to stop for today because I don't want to bore everybody with a history lesson. I do actually love history. So, you know, I found this very, very interesting because there were so many things that were similar. You know, we're looking at the socioeconomic um, issues today. I'm kind of looking at the difference. And this is, you know, the difference is not the comparison here, the, how social media and the communications from 2018, how they are in complete opposite ends of the spectrum on how people were getting their information. So, you know, I know this is in some ways not really related to how we live our lives day to day now, but it, I think it's worth taking a look at how things were addressed almost 100 years ago and see where things have changed. And also then looking at the parts that haven't changed, figuring out why and trying to find a way to make sure it doesn't happen in the future, whether it's hopefully not due to another pandemic, but even in just the day-to-day -day needs um, that everybody needs, especially when it's in regards to medicine. There were a lot of things done in 1918 that were very similar to what happened at the um, beginning of the pandemic in 2020. Um, a lot of cities did try to, you know, put in an effort to reduce the number of cases. Unfortunately, just like today, there weren't any consistent you know, policies. It varied by state to state, by city to city. So it was very hard to really contain the infection if there wasn't going to be a consistency. Um, but they did find the cities which you know, did have containment plans and ones that were pretty much followed, they did have lower infection rates. So, um, you know, I, I do look back last year and I, I don't know if possibly we had done a little more to, you know, for two weeks, you know, self-isolate, quarantine, find a way to do that if everybody had been able to do that if the numbers would have been able to drop. Um, you know, can't really go back in time and find that out. But while reading this and it said, you know, cities that were able to follow a containment plan really did reduce um, the number of cases. So, um, you know, back in 1918, they, they had a good plan and it seems like some cities were really able to, um, you know, to control the actual spread of the disease. Um, so I think this is where I'm going to stop for today because I don't want to bore everybody with a history lesson. I do actually love history. So, you know, I found this very, very interesting because there were so many things that were similar. You know, we're looking at the socioeconomic, um, issues today. I'm kind of looking at the difference. And this is, you know, the difference is not the comparison here, the, how social media and the communications from 2018, how they are in complete opposite ends of the spectrum on how people were getting their information. So, you know, I know this is in some ways 
not really related to how we live our lives day to day now, but it, I think it's worth taking a look at how things were addressed almost 100 years ago and see where things have changed. And also then looking at the parts that haven't changed, figuring out why and trying to find a way to make sure it doesn't happen in the future, whether it's hopefully not due to another pandemic, but even in just the day-to-day -day needs um, that everybody needs, especially when it's in regards to medicine. Now, just very quickly um, before I did go, I did want to kind of touch on a topic and it's because it hits a little close to home um, and I really, I don't mean to offend anybody, so I, that's not my intent, but I, I myself have had to open a GoFundMe when I needed a wheelchair, um, but I've come across, I came across one where it seemed like the person was very obviously scamming. Um, I researched the name when I put it in and there were you know, GoFundMe's going back for a couple of years. Basically, it was just going in, changing a couple words. That was that. Um, so I look forward to next week going a little bit more into some of the different aspects, um, you know, looking at those issues as far as, um, you know, socioeconomic, um, the ease of communication that we have, not only the ease, but the willingness of communication, because we did see that here too, that, you know, it things weren't very upfront in some ways. And then also looking at the way technology has advanced everything basically. So it's kind of tying everything together. So I'm gonna try to see if I can fit all of that into one episode, but we really might be looking at a three-parter. Um, so I really, again, I appreciate you taking some time out to listen. Um, if you do enjoy the podcast, please, please um, feel free to share it with your friends. You know, I, like I said, I just kind of want to spread some encouragement and positivity. So um, you're sharing it or listening to it. Um, if the app where you listen to the podcast, um, whether it's the actual podcast or YouTube, um, if you feel like you want to leave a com comment or a review, I'd really appreciate it. You know, this is all kind of new to me. Um, I'm getting this out a little bit late just because, you know, I had everything set up last week with my phone to record and that's a much better quality. And after about two hours of trying to figure it out, um, you know, I said, I'm not going to get it out, get this, you know, episode out if I don't just start recording. So, um, so hopefully next week I'll have it all fixed. But, um, you know, I do have all of my contact information linked in the description as well if you wanna send an email or go to the webpage, um, which I'm still working on building. Um, I would say 20 years ago, I was pretty tech savvy and people would ask me a lot about, you know, computers. You know, things are, like I said, moving very quickly and it takes me a little bit longer to figure some things out now, so. Um, yeah, you know, I'll do my best to try to get, you know, better video and everything up and a better website going. Um, but I really, you know, again, I appreciate you spending some time with me today and I look forward to talking to you next week. Thank you. Bye.